I was out at the vigil last night for Next Benedict, and it broke my heart what I heard out there. And so I am a retired law enforcement, 9-11 World Trade Center first responder, but I think being trans has been harder than that, dealing with that. Um, I think people don't understand this is a soul journey. This is a process. I started my process in 2009. I did not, because of my illness from 9-11, did not physically transition until I was 54 years old. I am 57 now, OK? <laughs> it's a soul journey. It's self-discovery. So when we stop children from discovering themselves, we're harming them. It's anybody, we're harming them. We should be on a self-discovery all the time, <laughs> not just at a certain age. We shouldn't be stopping at a certain age. So, you know, I am just so thankful that I have the ability as a retired law enforcement officer to go across this country and to speak to individuals. And stories are part of that. Telling my story, I've also learned to listen to other people's story. And it has been an impactful time for me. I have grown myself listening to parents, what's happening in, for parents in this country because their kids are being denied general health care. That's really what it is. It's health care, psychological care. You know, we should be supporting our children just like we tell them to play this sport or that sport. We'll try piano, try this, try that. It's the same thing. They need to do some self-discovery. So today, originally, I said to Reverend Sarah and Lori and Amanda, I want to talk to the folks that live here in Idaho. I want everybody here to know what they're experiencing and what their journey has been. Because I, you could read my story in authentic selves, but it's important as a visitor here that I give space to my siblings. And so thank you for coming, Bonnie Violet, Liliana. I do not know either one of these individuals. <laughs> but I know that we're going to connect. So thank you for being here. And thank you for allowing me to come to your state. So Bonnie Violet, tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> Good? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Bonnie Violet. Say hi back. <laughs> yes, it helps with the anxiety, so thank you. Um, yeah, um, I, I grew up in Wendell, Idaho. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> I know for most of you, it's probably just an exit you pass on your way to somewhere else. Um, but um, I, I was born and raised there through high school. And um, I, I just turned 45, actually, Wednesday. Um, and, and I just moved, I moved back to Idaho about a year ago, almost to the day. Um, moved back to Idaho after being able to get away for a little while. I was able to move out to Chicago and San Francisco for a little while, as I mentioned, I, I did, um, I was lucky enough to um, found the HIV AIDS organization um, back in 2003 that's now just celebrated 20 years, uh, which is crazy. Um, <clears throat> so through that experience, I really, I mean, I, I don't know, I was, just, I was in my 20s, so I definitely learned a lot. Um, you know, I started my transition during COVID. Um, I was stuck with myself in San Francisco <laughs> in my room for a really long time. And uh, I had kind of um, played with the idea of being trans, I guess. I was perfectly confident as like a bearded lady, so to speak, like before my transition, like as a flamboyant gay boy, I guess, if you will. Um, but it never, I just never quite, it just never quite fully fit, I guess. And I was able to start to do drag. Um, I'm, I'm clean and sober from drugs and alcohol 16 years now. And, 
and through and through that I was able to to do drag to raise money for the sober community. And then through that process, I like I never wanted to get out of the clothes or the look. I was like, <laughs> I like this, you know, and all the other drag artists are like, I can't wait to get out of this. And I'm like, no, let's go out. Like, let's, you know. <laughs> and so um, through that experience, luckily, it gave me a place and a platform that I could like safely or comfortably um, kind of play with gender a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, so I started transitioning like in my early 40s. So it's been pretty new. There's a lot of programming to unprogram uh, growing up in Wendell. Um, and so that's really been a big journey for me. I moved back here a year ago, and I've spent most of my time in my apartment by myself. Um, and I don't say that to, like, I, you know, it's been a soul journey. You know, I've, I've really been able to have a relationship with myself that I don't think I've had in my entire life. I, I pride myself as always living authentically and um, truthful as much as I can. Um, and, um, you know, this has just caused me to come to a whole nother understanding of myself and I think a deeper truth and more of a spirit, for me, it's a spiritual identity and it's created from my, my spiritual experience. So I think I'll leave it at that for now because I feel like I've talked a lot, but um, yeah. <laughs> You know, Liliana, I just want you to know you're one of the reasons, the youth voice, you're my hero. Because you go out and you use your voice, and you, you're the reason I get up and go. So can you share a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Um, well, I just want to start off by thanking everybody for being here. This is such a beautiful event, and I'm so glad to have the privilege of participating in it. Um, my name is Liliana. Um, I am a junior at Boise High School, um, but I live in Eagle, which is about 25 minutes away from Boise. Um, and one of the reasons that I go to Boise High is because it's such a wonderful, accepting, open community there. Um, and so I honestly feel very lucky because I have the ability to go to Boise High where they are not shy to hang up pride flags in classrooms and to advocate for the queer community. Um, but it's not always been like that for me, because in ninth grade, I attended Bishop Kelly High School. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who don't know what that is, no. um, it's a private Catholic um, high school here in Idaho. Um, and as during ninth grade, when I went there, I was very confused as to how I identified. Um, I still, at that time, I was presenting as male, um, and I didn't have any idea like what I was feeling, like why I, I didn't like my name, why I didn't like my pronouns. Um, and I just felt very isolated because it's something that I couldn't talk about with anybody else at that school. Um, it was a very uh, closed off environment for people like me. Um, but while I was there, I was able to start a belonging community of students who felt isolated and alone like I did. Um, and we were able to create posters and just try and make the school a more welcoming environment. And that kind of idea of trying to make a hard place better for people is what has, I guess, motivated me to be more active. Um, and so a little over a year ago, I started, after I moved to Boise High, I started the Queer Teens of Boise, um, which is an organization that provides a safe and inclusive space for all LGBTQ high school students across the Treasure Valley area. Um, we have a few members out in the audience. Feel free to raise your hands. Um, but it's been, it's honestly been an honor because the group is just such a, it's such a wonderful place where people don't have to worry about not being able to be themselves. They just get to exist and build that community and live their lives without anybody questioning them. And so it's a really, really beautiful group, and I'm honored to be the leader of it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, what an honor to be here with both of you. Um, you know, Bonnie File, I was watching um, some of your videos, getting to know who you were. Talk about um, the spirituality piece that you like to um, talk about and, and 
get people to understand what that really means. Yeah, um, I grew up in church <laughs> in uh, Wendell, Idaho. Actually, I went to Hagerman because you know you never hang out in your hometown. Um, <laughs> Not if you're cool, anyway. And uh, well, I really wasn't that cool. But um, uh, so, and I loved Jesus and I loved church. Like, it was a safe place for me because I didn't feel safe at home. I didn't feel safe at school. There wasn't many places I felt okay. I was always getting corrected. I never knew it at the time, but my, my, my father was always telling me, you know, why do you sit like that or like speak up or get your hands off your face or, you know, like correcting my gender expression. Um, I didn't know it the time that that's what was happening. Um, but it made me very insecure and very uncomfortable with expressing myself or knowing how to express myself in a way that wasn't going to cause some sort of negative reaction from my father. Um, and so church was a place that I didn't have to think about sexuality or gender. And for whatever reason, it was a safe place for me to land. Um, but then when I was 19, I was infected with HIV. Um, one of the first times I, the first time I could get infected, I did. Um, and that was a huge adjustment for me. And that is actually what kind of pushed me away from being involved in church and that sort of stuff, because I didn't feel like I could go to church with that part of myself. Um, that might have been true or not, I don't know. Um, but I didn't have the capacity for it in my mind to think. At that time, I just thought God loved me anyway. Um, still had like a lot of shame and a lot of things to work through. And luckily for me, I was able to fall into grace. Um, when I, I don't advocate for this, but um, life was really hard and I needed to soften the blow of life a little bit. And so I, I started clubbing and doing drugs and drinking and I fell into this queer community and I learned how to love myself as a queer person. And I learned what it meant to be a queer person. And it was such a a beautiful time in a lot of ways. Um, but God and all that sort of stuff kind of went away. Once I got sober, I kind of brought into that idea of like, I saw like queer people talking about God and shit. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, how does that work? Um, but they weren't, you know, they weren't doing drugs anymore. And they were living these lives that I didn't think were possible for people like us. You know, I just didn't think we had the same opportunities in life that other people did. And so um, the God that I came to understand had nothing to do with church. Like it was far from church for a really long time. Um, uh, I got, you know, I, I think it changed for me when um, my, I, my nephew passed away in my arms and that experience was beautiful and tragic. Um, and I just felt so honored to be there. And it felt like that was a time that I really wanted to get back into being a spiritual, like, person, like, but also, like, of service in a spiritual way. And I was like, but I'm queer, so how do I do that? And so I started s serving as a queer chaplain. And so I work with people around um, death to self uh, in the form of identities. I think when we come to see ourselves differently, we have to die in order so we can live and so many times in my life that's happened and I, I never saw or was aware of the fact that I had a spirit or soul during that time. And I, now that I can do that, I, there's just so much power in that for me. And so I like to help people invite whatever sort of understanding into that experience. Um, but I do believe that like, I've come to the point where I call myself Bonnie Violet and I ask you to do the same because of my seeking of some sort of higher purpose and calling. Um, I do believe that um, I, you know, I, I'm created to be trans in this moment in time. Uh, that is my role on this earth and my, my cause and my purpose. Um, whether or not um, I was born this way, I don't know. I think there's evidence to show that, but I, don't, I really hate the fact to think that we have to be born this way. Like, Creation didn't stop when we were born, you know? And for a long time, I was just a product of everything else that happened to me. Like, that was my creation. And at some point in time, I think when I finally transitioned, I started to become a co-creator with my creator. And I'm becoming um, more. And I'm doing that because I'm connecting with what's inside of me and what's inside of you 
and what connects us all. And so my transness, like I'm called, I, I believe I'm, yeah, it's just such a spiritual thing to me. And in that way, like nobody can deny it because I know it for, for me, you know, like the, the spirit is good, the body in the world is a little bit more of the challenge. Um, but yeah, so it's just, it's such a, I know that it's birthed out of my, my spiritual seeking, I guess, and understanding. Okay. <laughs> nice. yeah. Yeah. Because our community has been so hurt by the church, a lot of my friends say, Joey, you're so religious. I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Yes, I do go to a middle collegiate church, is my home church in New York City. That is where I understood that I too have a seat at God's table. But I also understood, just like you're saying, Bonnie Violet, that I was called to be trans. It was up to me to walk in that faith, to understand that faith process in that journey. Um, and it's not about religion. It's about that connection that you have with your creator, whoever that may be, the universe, God, you know, Allah, whoever that may be. And so I, I appreciate what you're saying there because it's so true that we, are, we don't go into those spaces because we've been so hurt. And it's so important to connect in that journey of spirituality, whatever that might be. Liliana, can you talk about who gave you such courage to come out and, and be so vocal? And how do you go about creating that safe space? Well, one thing. Oh, is this? Okay. Um, one thing that I would like to start off by saying is that I have two of the most amazing parents in the entire world that are sitting right there. Are they here? Where are they? Will you stand up? They're right there. And the... <laughs> and when I first came out as transgender to them, they... Ever since that, they have been so incredibly supportive and have just wanted the best for me and have always supported me no matter what. And so I get a lot of my strength from them because I know no matter how hard things are in the world, in Idaho, I still have two people who will love and support me no matter what. And that's such a beautiful thing and I'm so grateful for it. Mm. But one thing that I notice that I really try and focus on when I'm creating spaces for queer youth is um, what, what would I have wanted when I was in ninth grade and felt so alone and unable to express who I was? What was missing for me? What would have given me some kind of hope? Um, and so just having the people who we can share stories with who we can make those connections with and just, I don't know, there's just something so beautiful about community. Like we have here in front of us, a beautiful community of people who's coming together to celebrate the trans and, non, and gender non-conforming community. And sharing our stories is such a powerful thing because it makes us feel not so alone and makes us feel valid. Um, so that's definitely the main reason that helps me create the spaces for queer youth. <laughs> One of the things I do is um, I have a program called Creating Safe Space in the Workplace. And I uh, work for a hospitality group both in California and in New York City. Creating that inclusive environment, people don't understand that um, that might be the only safe place that folks have. Um, and we are very discriminated against in the workplace. So I found a couple of hospitality groups that are willing to embrace us. And so I do have a program that's called Creating Safe Spaces. So thank you for doing that. Um, Ani Violet, I watched one of your videos and I was struck. You were walking down the street in New York City. Yeah. And 
I was struck by your vulnerability. Um, we speak often, right? You, you, I don't think people understand what it's like for activists, for especially trans, non-binary folks, LGBT folks who actually go out in the world and, and do speak. We have our moments of vulnerability. So I would like you to share what the community could do to support you. Um, Bonnie Violet was walking down New York City. It was a year anniversary, and my anniversary for starting hormones was only a few months before yours, a year anniversary. And she was walking down the street and filming herself so that everybody could see, and all of a sudden, there was a moment of, oh my gosh, I'm sharing this on video. I'm talking. She had, and she said, took a breath, I'm feeling so vulnerable now. What can the community do to support you to when you have those moments? I think, especially right now, <laughs> as an activist, we have hard days too. And so please share that with, with the folks here, your community. I don't know that I have a clear answer for you all. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I, I'm still figuring out so much. And so much is, I think, a, a me gig. You know, like there's so much that I'm still figuring out for myself and working through my own fears and anxieties. So I think just having people with me in that is helpful. You know, uh, I feel so new in my transness. And sometimes I feel like I'm not um, ready, <laughs> you know, or I'm like the best person to speak about being trans. But I've always been really open about who I am as an AIDS activist for years and um, in sobriety. And so like it just trans is something that I have held a lot closer to my heart. Um, and I'm still kind of figuring it out. But one of the things that I came to understand or found helpful is like when I when I started Alpha, I was just, you know, a 20 four-year-old kid that was scared of the freaking world and I just needed a space for me um, to be in and I remember like um, you know I wrote down alpha, the idea of alpha on a napkin and I presented it to Lee Flynn at Idaho Women's Network and they encouraged me to do it um, but you know through that process I was very much you know I think because I grew up in church and I was all about like Jesus and saving people you know because that's what I thought I was supposed to do and so I think when I found out I had HIV, I think I like had, get, had failed everyone. And so there was a, a deep desire for me to validate my existence. Like I needed to do something worth the crap before I died so that my life could matter. And so I started out very um, self-centered, motivated, I guess, in some ways. I can see that now. But the thing that happened was is that like I started to create this space and all these people started coming and they loved me anyway. And there were so many other people like me. And there were parents and who had like lost their kids decades ago who, who didn't have a space to like work through some of that stuff. You know, and I just, I don't know, I just people just kept showing up for me and they 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 loved me and they like that I don't they just I don't know, it was so weird. There was healing that happened. You know, it's like I think for me, like, tell me I'm beautiful, you know, like Tell me that, like, ask me about, like, like, try to point out the joy and the happy stuff for me, I think. Um, a lot of people, I think, are afraid to talk to trans people about what's going on. And I think there's a mindfulness about that, right? Um, but I think with people that you, you are close with who are trans, I think just, like, see them, acknowledge them. Because I think that's the hardest thing for me is, like, you know, being in a relationship with someone and they don't want to talk about, or that I can't talk to them about what I'm going through. And, and you can't, and sometimes I feel like you can't really identify with me because you're not going, like if you're not trans or gender non-conforming, you, you don't get it. But um, it's helpful when people who are not like me um, can show me love and affirmation as well, because that helps me feel better about everyone else in the world, I guess. You know, it's, um, I think the big thing is just, I don't know, like just 
knowing that just seeing us, you know, and acknowledging us in ways that are, are positive and affirming because I, I just went to Vegas and I was with a bunch of peop people that I didn't know too well and we were like walking around Vegas and stuff and they like were like, all these people are looking at you and they're like pointing at you and they're like, I'm like, yeah, that's my life, you know, like that's the way that it is. And, and sometimes it's, sometimes they're saying great things. Um, some, usually they're not, or they're just gawking or whatever, and, and that's hard. It's hard to um, go out into the world knowing that that might happen. You know, and I do believe that most people are pretty freaking great. I believe that in my heart that most people are kind, or most people don't care, really. And there are only a few people <laughs> who are, you know, that I need to be scared of, but those few people sometimes are what um, have the most power over me. So I think the biggest thing is just being in spaces with trans people and talking about the trans people that you love, referring to them as how they are now with other people as well, I think is really important too. Um, to where I'm Bonnie Violet with you always, not that you're like talking to my mom and I'm her son all of a sudden, because um, I know that happens a lot too. Um, but I think make sure, making sure you're having those conversations about us and when we're not in the room as well. I think, yeah. <laughs> One of the, um, authentic, what I love about authentic selves is we um, not only included bio family, but we also included chosen family. So as many of us have chosen family because our families do not acknowledge us. And so it is uh, important. I've gone to um, the PFLAG National Convention. I was at there last year, and I met this person named Jim Anderson, um, who has a TED Talk out um, about the journey he took as a parent with a lesbian child. But it was still the journey that parents have to do separately, friends have to do separately, than we, than us, because sometimes you have the right to grieve. You have the right to go through your own emotions. It's just not so great sometimes to put it on, on us. And so we have our journey. You have your journey. And we have to acknowledge that. But as someone who I have my chosen family in the book because my family was not um, accepting um, of me. And actually, uh, my chosen sister flew from Vegas uh, and is here today. <laughs> and so it's so important to remember that, um, especially, you know, uh, we do have our challenges with our own families. And it's so wonderful to see that your parents support you. So um, thanks for sharing that. And that's the one of the wonderful things about I like about authentic selves is that we included chosen family. So what would you like to say to your siblings, your younger siblings, especially the folks that are struggling? I would tell them that it is I that I know how tough it is to be in their position because it can often feel like the world is just closing in around you and you have no space to express yourself and that is a terrible feeling. But I think that the way to find some kind of hope is through connecting with other people, finding your chosen family, figuring out community spaces where you can go and share who you are feel that validation and it's such a good feeling when you're finally able to have your identity validated. So it's just to keep going because when you, just by existing, just existing as we are is a struggle because there are so many people that don't understand and don't want to understand who we are. So just by existing, as we are, and showing the world how beautiful our identities are, that is a, an amazingly courageous thing to do. So just by showing that you are here 
and that you are going to continue to exist no matter what anybody else says is a very powerful thing too. Well, I want to, where's the, if we have time for questions now, if you have any questions, but I do want to say that um, chosen family has been very important to me. Um, my mom, um, 83 years old, <laughs> 84 years old, um, it was very hard. I had several conversations with her. And even as a kid, she knew I was different. When I was nine, she called me in. You know, I think I'm 6'5", but as you can see, uh, delusion is grandeur there. But, you know, she called me in when I was nine and said to me, um, grabbed me. She's from Brooklyn. <laughs> she grabbed me by the collar and said, you look like you're standing in a hole out there. I want you to always remember in the back of your head, you and what army is going to take you down. Because you're always going to probably be doing things in life that you're going to be standing alone. Well, I'm not standing alone, am I? Right? We're not standing alone, right? So, and, and I didn't remember that to the day I got baptized. And I was up there getting baptized, and my mother passed away in 2021. And she, she would not call me. She only called me by my birth name. She would not call me Joey. She refused to call me Joey. But she called me. I called, talked to her every day. And she called me on the phone and said, you need to get here. I live in Sedona. She lived in New Jersey. And I drove, like, really fast, two days. And she called me on the phone all the way there. Get here, get here. I'm waiting for you. And I got there on a Friday. She came out of the ambulance to go into hospice at home. And there was a huge fight between my siblings and I on the front lawn. So I went to a hotel after driving so many hours, not being there with my mother. I felt like somebody punched me in my chest, that my gender identity trumped my mother dying. And then I thought about my siblings who get thrown out of their house, especially my younger siblings, because they're trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming, LGBT, you know? And so I said, OK, at least I have a roof over my head. I can afford that. And the next morning, I text both of my siblings, and I said, our, mother's dying. My, our mother is dying, and that means my mom, too. You don't want to be around me? Leave. But I'm coming. And so Saturday, Sunday, sat with her. Saturday night, all day long, she was saying goodbye to her friends. She knew. My mother knew she was going. And Saturday night, I was sitting by her bed, and she was sleeping, and her uh, her caregiver was there with me, and her caregiver said, she's, she's talking to somebody. You could see my mother's mouth was moving. She's talking to somebody. About 9.30 at night, my mother popped up, looked at me, and said, hey, Joey, last word she ever spoke. Okay? So there is hope. <laughs> there is hope. All right? So remember that when you're estranged from your family, <laughs> there is hope. There is somebody up there telling them, hey, listen, this is not the right thing to do. <laughs> we are going to have some time.